Good morning. Good morning. I hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Old St. Andrews this morning. Can you stand and pray your hearts in the Lord's presence and worship as we sing our opening song?
Old Testament lesson from Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the mountains of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains for which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took his hand, the fire, and the knife, so they were both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, he said, Here I am, my son, he said. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am, he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that, name of that place. The Lord will provide, as it is said on this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. God's promises to Abram. God came to Abram and made a promise. Abram, you are very special to me. I will take care of you and give you lots of children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. But Abram asked God many times, Are you sure? I don't have any children yet. God thought Abram needed something more to help him understand. So God took Abram outside and showed him the night sky. Your family will include as many people as there are stars in the sky, God told Abram. Abram stared up at all those stars. He couldn't begin to count all those twinkling lights. Stars and stars and stars all around him. Abram looked up at the stars and saw God at work. Abram believed God. Now for another promise, said God to Abram. You need a place for your huge family to live. I will give you this land as I promised. Are you sure, God? Abram asked again. God made a covenant with Abram, a promise that Abram would become a father and a grandfather and a great grandfather and a great great grandfather and a great 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 grandfather and on and on. And all Abram's many, many sons, daughters, grandsons, and granddaughters would live with God in the land on which Abram stood, Lord of the Lord. Thank you. 
Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. And pray with me while you're still standing. Father, we come to you now. We pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon us all, upon me to preach your word upon your people to hear your word, Lord, and upon us all to take it into our hearts and to do it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lent. Ha, I left my glasses over there. <laughs> no, well, you know, that just means we're going to fly without a net this morning. Lent is a difficult season. It's difficult passages to preach through. It's difficult things, different, difficult concepts. More than anything else, very difficult applications for you and I as followers of Jesus. You've just heard some of the harshest words from Jesus' mouth to his disciples that we encounter in all the scriptures, right? He looks at Peter and Peter says, hey, hey, this ain't going to happen. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. All right, well, those are harsh words, but you know what? If you and I are honest with ourselves this morning, there has probably been some instance in our lives when Jesus has asked us to do something and we have responded in a Peter-like fashion and we too were worthy of get behind me, Satan. Now, was Jesus saying that Peter was really Satan there? No, he's just saying that Peter had in mind things of the world and not the things of the kingdom. And this is a hard passage. Why? Because Jesus looks right at his disciples and says, listen, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus told that to his disciples plainly. He didn't give it to them in a parable, he plainly told them that. And they were unable to hear it because they had preconceived notions preconceived notions of what the Messiah should be like and therefore preconceived notions of what following that Messiah would be like, right? They had visions and hopes and dreams of a nice military hero where they came out on top. And Jesus is saying, no, the, the path ahead is a path of suffering. The path ahead is a path of suffering. And the first thing within that, Jesus tells them they're going to die. He's going to die. He tells them they're going to follow him. They're going to take up a cross. And then he encourages them to think about that. And in reality, those are three things and, and that we're going to look at today. And that is sort of the, the fact or the truth of death, the fact or the truth of suffering, and the fact and the truth of having to count the cost. And we're going to start with the truth or the fact of death. Death is a part of life. None of us are going to get out of this world alive, yet death is something that we naturally avoid, isn't it? Isn't it something we actually try to avoid? Yes. Yes, it is. And that's perfectly natural, right? As living beings, we want to continue to live. It is beneficial for us to keep on living. That's natural. Even though we are at the top of the, the food chain and top of development, we still have instincts, and part of that is to 
try to survive. Now, for some of us, those are stronger than others. Like, I have a very strong instinct of not to be on anything very high or dangerous, whereas other people, um, my, my wife, likes to be up on heights and likes roller coasters and likes all of those things that I don't do. If you ever have the privilege of, of, of flying with me on an airplane, you will see the whitest knuckles that have ever been seen on this planet. I just don't like those things. I have an instinct of, of being 30,000 feet in the air is not conducive for a soft-bodied mammal. It just doesn't work. But yet the truth this morning is Jesus lays out for his disciples that the path ahead for him is a path that is going to include death. And we can't get away from that. That's part of it. But from that we have to glean this truth that there are some things that are worth pouring one's life out for. And Jesus is trying to teach us in this moment that following whatever it is that God has for us is one of those things. Now, we know this. We celebrate uncommon valor all the time, don't we? We decorate the soldier that gives his life for, for others, right? We can't name that many living Medal of Honor recipients, can we? That's usually something that's giving out posthumously. We honor and celebrate the fireman that runs into the burning building. We honor and celebrate the police officer that runs into the active shooter situation. We recognize that those people are doing a service in which they potentially get up every day and leave knowing that there's a chance they won't come home in a way that you and I don't face that. Now, there's always that chance, right? We might get up out of bed and drop dead like that, but... Most of us, there's not something inherent within which what we do that further exacerbates that. Well, Jesus is challenging us today to think in terms of following him as something like that. That following him is a moment that's going to, to be like that. Now, why is that? Well, Jesus knows in his heart, knows in a way that you and I don't know, that his particular calling is shaped and formed by pouring out his life for the sake of the world. Now, you and I aren't called to die Jesus' death. We're called to follow him. We're called to go after him in that. And the lesson for us from just that little bit is that there are some things in life that are worth pouring yourself out for, right? Whatever that might look like. And that brings us to sort of the second point, which is suffering. There's a truth or an inevitability to suffering. Jesus, in this passage, goes on to say, okay, Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Now again, let's reiterate. Jesus doesn't tell his disciples, take up my cross. Jesus' cross is uniquely suited to him. But guess what? Your cross is uniquely suited to you. My cross is uniquely suited to me. But it's a cross. What Jesus doesn't say here is take up your rainbow of happiness. Jesus doesn't take say, take up your source of self-fulfillment and actualization. He doesn't say any of that. He says, take up your cross. The cross is a source of suffering and punishment and shame. Now, we often don't think about that, but the cross is an instrument of shame as much as it was an instrument of torture. You know, the, the, the cross was reserved for the most vile offenders in society. You and I would use the label terrorist. That's the only term that can really translate the word lestai. It's terrorist. It was reserved for terrorists. And people who were crucified were crucified nude on crosses. It was an instrument of shame. And these were shame cultures where being put on display like that would have been very, very shameful for you and for your family and for everything like that. So the cross is an instrument of torture, an instrument of shame. And Jesus says, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. And it's very difficult for us to, to figure that out, to understand it, because we would like it to be that following Jesus means we get sort of an escape from some of those things, don't we? That's what we would like, that somehow following Jesus means we don't have to suffer, we don't have to go through those things. But that's not true. And here's why. Guys, suffering, it's endemic to human life. Everybody suffers in some way, shape, or form. Everybody suffers physically or spiritually or emotionally, relationally. Someone suffers in every way like that. And, you know, and the difficult part of life is you and I know people and we know this much about them and we don't know 
the other part. We don't know, for the most part, the problems in which people are carrying, the burdens, the suffering, the things in which they are in. And see, as we follow Jesus, we're following the picture that God gives us of the perfect human. You see, God presents Jesus to us in the Scriptures again and again as the perfect or the last Adam. And what it means to follow, to be made after Him, to be made in His image, is to participate in those things. And as we're following Him, as we're following this example of what it means for a human to follow after God, and that human suffered, we too will go through suffering in that. It's, it's inescapable. It's inescapable. It's part of what we must face. Part of the difficulty of preaching these Lenten sermons is preaching through these hard moments. And so with the reality of, of having to pour our lives out and within the reality of having to suffer in following Jesus, then we have to come to terms with counting the cost, right? Sort of latent within that idea of if you're going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. It's sort of a call of is it going to be worth it to you or not? in some way, shape, or form, right? Now, the beautiful thing is there's, 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 there's layers in following Jesus. Let me explain this for you, right? Jesus had 12 close disciples, right? He had at least 120 followers in a bigger circle, and he had a little tiny circle of people that followed him ever so closely. That's Peter, James, and John, right? So within that, we see three, 12, 120. It's concentric circles. And what you and I have to figure out is counting the cost. Because the closer you follow Jesus, guess what? The closer you are to the suffering. The closer you follow Jesus, the closer you are to the suffering. The 120 suffered, sure. They didn't suffer in the same way that the 12 did, and the 12 suffered, and the 12 didn't suffer in the same way that the inner three did, did they? No, they didn't. The closer you follow Jesus, the more likely you are to actually suffer. And therein lies the moment where you have to count the cost. How much are you willing to bear? And that's a question that only each of us must come to. But there's hope even in that. And for me, the hope and the answer to these two, to, well, to these three sort of issues we've opened up today come in our other readings that are presented to us this morning. This great reading from Abraham in Genesis, right? That's probably the greatest story in Abraham's life. He's going willing in this moment to take his son and to sacrifice him, even though God has said, I'm going to promise you this, I'm going to promise you that, and it's tied to this boy. He goes willingly to sacrifice him. But there, what happens? In the last moment, the angel of the Lord appears and says, don't touch the boy. Don't touch him. And God provides in that moment a ram caught in the thicket, provides the sacrifice necessary in that moment. God himself provides the lamb caught in the thicket. And in that moment, we come with this great phrase of Jehovah Jireh. The Lord shall provide, and from that moment on, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. So, whatever sacrifice is necessary for your suffering, for my suffering, we can take some genuine peace in knowing that on the mountain of the Lord, it is satisfied. On the mountain of the Lord, whatever is necessary for our suffering to endure it, to go through it, to come out the other side of it, has already been provided. And then that's fleshed out by Paul in his epistle reading, which we didn't read this morning, which comes from Romans 8. And Paul says, who's going to separate us from the love of God? Or what's going to separate us from the love of God? And he goes on to say, is it going to be something high? Is it going to be something low? Is it going to be some action of another person? Is it going to be height or depth or or principalities or powers? What in this entire cosmos can separate us from the love of God? Why? Because he says before, if God is for us, Who can be against us? That nothing ultimately will separate you from the love of God. And so as you and I have to stop in this Lenten season and reflect on the fact that there's there's no escaping death and there's no escaping suffering, 
And there's no escaping having to count the cost. We can rest in knowing that in the midst of all of that, the answer has been provided and nothing can separate us from the love of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now on page 7, let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father. Let us offer our prayers to God. Lord God, we thank you for the leaders of our church, especially Archbishop Beach, Bishop Lawrence, Bishop Skelton, Father Marshall, Father Donnie, Father Joe, Father David, and our staff, and we ask you to bless them. We also pray for St. Andrew's Mission and their vicar, Father Jimmy Gallant. Lord God, we pray for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. In particular for all saints, church in Florence, their rector, their rector, Father Jason Hanshaw, Chelsea, and their family. For San Jose Church in the Dominican Republic, their rector, Father Sandino Sanchez, and their bishop, Moises Cazada. And for Father Rob Sturdy, Anglican chaplain at the Citadel. Lord God, we pray for the leaders of our country, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, Mayor Technenberg, and we ask you to bless them. Lord God, we thank you for all our blessings, especially for people who love and care for us. We ask you to take care of everyone who is sick or sad. Especially Isaac Nettles, Nancy Glenn, Susie Compton, Boz Carnes, Julia Adams, and all others remain at this time. Lord God, we know you hear us when we pray. We ask that you answer our prayers as may be best for us. Let us now confess our sins to Almighty God.
forgiveness of sins to all those who depart in repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Uh, our work at San Jose Church 
uh, are on sale out there at the table. So please stop at the table. Any donation is welcome and helps out the DR mission efforts. And they, Lord knows, they need it right now because that country has been very hard hit by this pandemic. And you can imagine a country that is so dependent on tourism with no tourists for a year uh, and what that has done to that economy down there. So uh, please stop by the table and please help us out by purchasing uh, a raffle ticket. $50 uh, for a ticket. Uh, one more announcement for you today, and that is uh, uh, thanks be to God that Isaac Metals is home and uh, the Metals family, uh, they're all doing well. I've talked to Brad almost every day and uh, they are doing well and he'll be back with us this week. So thanks be to God for that as well. So a lot of good news today. Um, I do want to say one more thing and that's for you people walking on, uh, watching online. And, uh, and that is we have a, a wonderful group assembled with us today. And to those online, uh, I would ask you, have you been in school lately? Have you been in a restaurant lately? We miss you in church lately, so come on back, all right? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.
come from you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, you bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the classical feast. The fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Amen. Now with our Savior Christ and his Father, we are all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, and forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. We do not presume to come to this your table, O Lord, trust in our
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being us.